Joining me now is Ben Rhodes, the former Deputy National Security Advisor under President Barack Obama. He's also the co-host of the podcast, Pod Save the World. He's an MSNBC political contributor. He's the author of the book, After the Fall, The Rise of Authoritarianism in the World We've Made. Uh, ben, thank you for being here. You're an imp important person to talk to because of your government experience, because you've studied this and you've written a book about it. So I, I, I wanted to sort of bring you in to talk to my viewers about Looking at this list of, of potential appointees, the list of people t Trump has chosen to join his administration with questionable backgrounds like Matt Gates and Tulsi Gabbard and RFK Jr., now he's asking the Senate to give up advice and consent. What's your, what's your take on how this is unfolding? Well, Ali, I think one of the useful things to do in this context is to almost think about the United States as if you were looking at it um, from the outside in. You know, like we... Uh, are, are, we're so accustomed to certain norms in this country that we are losing sight of the fact that what is happening here is the kind of state capture that has happened in other democracies around the world, where we've seen right-wing nationalist, populist autocrats take power and kind of methodically remake the government in their own image. And that's what's happening here. Trump learned from his first term in office. If you compare the appointments, in his first term, he didn't really know Almost all of the people he pointed to some of the key positions that you're pointing to. Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, conventional views as a longtime general. Rex Tillerson, a businessman tapped to be Secretary uh, of State. Uh, the National Security Advisor became H.R. McMaster in 2017, another general he didn't know particularly well. John Kelly, who was his uh, Secretary of Homeland Security. Those people aren't here this time. None of those people are here this time because those are not people that would do whatever he wanted. And so what you have here is a mix of people, some of whom with more conventional resumes, like Marco Rubio, but even a Rubio is someone who's completely remade himself into a MAGA devotee. He's communicated in his public actions and his private, I'm sure, communications with Trump that he'll carry out whatever order is given. And then you have people like a Matt Gates or a Tulsi Gabbard or a Hedgeth at uh, DOD who are there to wreck those agencies. Uh, they want there to be a mass exodus of civil servants. They want there to be kind of chaos. They actually probably want there to be a big fight over whether these people are appropriate because they're going to go after the quote unquote deep state. This is what he wants. He wants to remake the government in the image of MAGA. Uh, he wants uh, to empty out the civil service and agencies he doesn't like, like the Department of Justice that he has a vendetta against. Um, and, you know, he wants to have free reign to do whatever he wants as president of the United States. And frankly, there's not a lot of guardrails to prevent him from doing that. Right. In the first term, we used to talk to some people about why they were doing it on or off the record. And they'd say, well, my country needs me. Or, you know, these are people who will be guardrails around Trump. They'll keep him from his worst uh, impulses. Now that that's gone, that doesn't lessen the responsibility for the rest of us who are not in government. But it can be unmotivating. So what do you say to people who are feeling like, I don't have this fight in me. Uh, I, I, I don't want to keep going. I don't know. I don't even know what keeping going looks like in this environment. You know, you said, look at from the outside in. I talked to Maria Ressa in the last hour, and it was pretty encouraging because she talks about it from, you know, the Philippines and their perspective. Uh, what do you say to people right now? Because I'm sure people are asking you this. Yeah, people are. And, and first of all, just to put a point on it, uh, you know, the, the Supreme Court is different than it was eight years ago. The Republicans in Congress are different. They, he's remade those institutions in his own image, too. So there's this lack of guardrails, right, that can be very demoralizing to people. And frankly, I don't think that the answer is to kind of rerun the playbook from 2017, when a lot of the Democratic messaging or the kind of quote unquote resistance messaging was about what an interloper Donald Trump is, what an outsider he is, how much he doesn't belong at the center of power. He is the center of power. He is the new establishment in this country, him and Elon Musk. I think that what that has to say to the rest of us, people can be demoralized. This is not forever. This is not forever. There's a midterm election in two years. Donald Trump is term limited in four years. Something is going to emerge on the back end of this. Uh, you know, I don't believe that Donald Trump's going to somehow magically change the Constitution and at age 82, you know, stay in power forever. Uh, that is not something that is uh, easily within his grasp. And so the message for us is, OK, yes, there are some immediate steps that need to be taken to protect vulnerable people. I think state governments, you know, we live in a big, complicated, sprawling f federal republic. Uh, a lot of powers are at the municipal and state level. 
And a lot can be done by Democratic governors, Republican governors uh, who maybe don't like this, or people at the local and community level as well. At the same time, uh, I think that their checks in terms of public opinion, their checks in terms of protests, their checks in terms of journalism, all those things can kind of hold a line uh, of truth and reality in the midst of the blizzard of disinformation and misinformation and activity that we're going to get from Trump. But at the same time, I think we have to be building back a different alternative uh, that the Democrats have not done in the last eight years about what is a different form of populism? What is a different criticism of the manipulation and corruption of power? Because we're going to see plenty of it over the next few years here so that we're prepared to seize that opportunity when there are elections again in one year and two years and four years. You, you, are, you, are, you are a government uh, official. You were a senior uh, advisor. You also have a role in the media. You've got a very important podcast. You're a contributor for us. You write a lot. Let's talk about the, particularly the attack on the fourth estate and, and journalism and journalists. Steve Bannon sent out a message that named us here at MSNBC and said, keep your records, we're coming after you. Cash Patel, we don't know whether he's getting a position in the government or not, has said very specifically they will come after journalists. There are enemies lists that are floating around with our names on it. Um, what, do you, what do you say specifically about the role that journalism has in preserving democracy and, and, and being uh, speaking truth to power in this moment? Well, this speaks to your last segment, which I thought was excellent, uh, because the reality is they want to create new information ecosystems that Americans live within. You know, they want platforms like X to be these kind of turbocharged vehicles for conspiracy theory, uh, for their version of reality. Uh, and then they want to try to silence people, investigative journalists, uh, people that are doing the kind of work to expose corruption. They want to either discredit those people, intimidate those people, harass those people. If you look at what's happened again in other countries, which can be useful because I'm sure that the Trump people have studied th these types of tactics, you know, their, their investigations into people their tax investigations, there's, there's, you know, audits, there's just kind of pure harassment to make life more difficult. Uh, I think what has to happen is there has to be a kind of collective will among that fourth estate um, to report on the truth, to not be intimidated. Uh, there's going to have to probably be support for certain people um, that may be wrongfully accused of things. But the reality is, I also find everywhere I go, people want to understand what is happening. Uh, I, I think we have to not follow Trump you know, everything he says, everything he truths or tweets, uh, he wants us to be talking about that kind of thing, the, the outrage of the day. Uh, we yep. should not be talking about, you know, this time around, Ali, you know, if he draws with a Sharpie on a picture of a hurricane, you know, uh, that's not the main story. The main story is the fundamental corruption of our federal government for the interest of one person. And, and I think telling people the truth about what is happening connecting dots for people, um, um, being very clear about what the stakes are. Uh, this is the kind of uh, reporting and the kind of messaging that I think Americans are looking for right now to understand what is happening uh, and not the kind of tit for tat and back and forth in the political realm that, that Trump kind of thrives on, because that's what he yeah. wants to, to, to have the focus be on, that, that everybody's arguing, everybody's polarized. Maybe that means everybody's the same. Everybody's I think not right the same that. here. Something very unusual in American history is happening and people need to shine a light on it. On November 8th, three days after the election, uh, you wrote in an article that was titled, I study guys like Trump. There's a reason they keep winning. You said Donald Trump has won the presidency, but I don't believe he will deliver on his promises. Like other self-interested autocrats, his rem remedies are designed to exploit problems instead of solving them. And he's surrounded by oligarchs who want to loot the system instead of reforming it. You identify the problem, but you actually think this might might come in his way, that he he he's as likely to not be successful in some of these efforts as he is to be successful. Yeah, well, I'll just give you a couple of examples. Uh, what are the two th things that we hear probably more about than anything else that he wants to do? Um, mass deportation of undocumented people in this country um, and tariffs, uh, huge across the board tariffs on goods that are coming into this country. You have studied markets. Those are probably about the two most inflationary things mm -hmm. that you can do. That is going to drive up costs in this country. And so if the reason he was elected is in large part, I think, dissatisfaction with cost of living in this country, the remedies he has for it, which are more about his ideological agenda, you know, America first tariffs, America first deportations, those things are going to make the things that angered a lot of voters much worse. If he comes in and gives a massive tax cut to wealthy people, to billionaires and corporations in this country, those things are going to exacerbate the inequality that is part of what has made people lose faith in systems in this country. Um, so the, the plans that he has 
are not going to remedy the injustices or the sense of grievance that a lot of people felt motivated by when they voted for him. And so that's why when I talk about not focusing on the crazy thing he says, focus on what he does. That's what we have to, to do this time around, because the things that he's going to be doing are going to be making the distrust in institutions and the sense of, uh, of the future not being as hopeful as the past. He, he's going to make those dynamics worse. But rather than arguing about some crazy thing he says, we need to be focusing on what is he doing.